Driving Society webinar on harness bits and more. My name is Jeff Morris. I am the current chairman of the American Driving Society Pleasure Driving Committee, and I have trained horses in Massachusetts at my own farm since the 1970s. I have specialized in training people and horses for carriage driving for the last 15 years or so. My family brought me up in the world of Morgan horses, and they happen to be very good uh, for carriage driving, but I train all breeds of horses and ponies for carriage sports and recreation. The topic of harness and bits is huge. In our brief hour we, can, we have, we can only cover it in sort of a broad sort of way. I encourage you to ask questions during the webinar as Susie has described using the tool on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we will not have time to answer all of them, but if you check on the webinar links on the ADS website in a few days, I intend to have a support document there which I will, uh, in which I will try to answer all your questions. In addition, I invite you to ask me questions privately afterwards through this email address at the bottom of your screen, and uh, I'll do the best I can to, to answer any questions you have. So let's get started. Oops, sorry. Okay. Here's our agenda for the webinar. Uh, my comments will be primarily focused on the single horse, but much of what we cover will be applicable to the multiple uh, hitches. Uh, also, I should say my comments are based on my own experience over the last 40 years of working with horses. Your mileage may vary a little bit. Uh, Part one, I will cover harnesses, so cover the material, style, sizing, fitting uh, of the basic harness parts, the bridle, collar, saddles, and breeching, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about how to fine tune some of that. Uh, at that, after I'm done with part one, we'll have a little time for questions, and then we'll start part two, which is on bits, um, the styles of bits that are out there, the various mouthpieces, cheek pieces, uh, the materials that they're made of, and how they should fit in your horse's mouth. This is a diagram that was a Christmas present from a customer of mine who was an illustrator of children's books. And she had an impossible time remembering what each harness part was called, so she drew this to let me know what she meant when she referred to things like the cart connector, which you see here, cart connector, or the loopy part, which is right here, loopy part, see, this loopy part. Uh, when first presented with a harness, it looks a lot like a lot of spaghetti, but once you understand what the function of each piece is for, it will make much more sense. Basically, the harness can be divided up into the four main pieces, the bridle, the collar, the saddle, and the bridging. The bridle, the collar, the saddle, and the bridging. I'm going to cover each of these four parts at some point during this webinar, but let's first take a look at the different materials that are used for making harnesses. One of the first choices you're going to be faced with when you uh, buy a new harness is the choice of synthetic or leather. Leather is, of course, the time-honored traditional material that has served carriage driving well for many, many years. But the synthetic materials such as beta, biothane, and nylon have found to be uh, quite useful for certain jobs. Um, and in fact, whole harnesses are now made out of them, and some of the materials are very good from a distance you cannot tell the difference between uh, leather and harness, uh, leather and synthetic. Leather harnesses last a long time if they're cared for and can look beautiful when aged if well maintained. They tend to fit and mold and shape better to the horse's uh, structures than some of the, the synthetics do. The downside is they take more care. Uh, they're a little bit heavier, they're more susceptible to moisture damage, and they may be more expensive than synthetic harnesses. Um, of the synthetic harnesses, the beta material is probably the most leather-like and, and certainly has its place. Uh, their synthetic harnesses are very easy to maintain, they're impervious to moisture, they're relatively, they have a relatively predictable braking strength, um, and they are generally a lot lighter than uh, the comparable leather harness. On the downside, uh, they're non-traditional and may look out of place where presentation and turnout scores matter. Synthetic materials tend to be stiffer, especially when cold, and do not develop in a very attractive aged patina like leather does. 
I've seen some leather harnesses that are 100 years old that just look absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I'm not sure we're going to get the same effect with a synthetic harness. Time will tell. Um, I think the jury is still out when it comes to the length of time that a synthetic harness can be in useful service. Uh, they're relatively new, so we don't really know. Um, I have one that I use every day in my training business. It goes on six to eight horses a day, six days a week, and I've been using it for five years. So that's pretty heavy duty uh, service, and it's uh, still in relatively pretty good shape. Uh, but I also have a leather harness for the same purpose that's almost 30 years old and still going strong. The, uh, you will see some harnesses made out of nylon. Um, I'm not a big fan of nylon harnesses. They tend to get dirty quite quickly. They cause a lot of chafing. Um, uh, they have very sharp edges to the strapping which can rub on your horse and, and make your horse a little bit sore. So I tend to stay away with them. They're very cheap though. Uh, one problem I've noticed when, with synthet synthetics is that builders are still using some of the same techniques that have evolved with creating leather harnesses that may not work so well with a material that doesn't stretch. And here on this slide that you've been staring at for the last couple of minutes, um, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. The top uh, slide shows us a synthetic strap with an oval slot for the holes for that tongue buckle. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the tongue buckle actually doesn't uh, lies at an angle through that hole. It doesn't go straight through. Um, and so uh, this oval slot's been punched to accommodate the shape and form of that uh, uh, buckle tongue. Uh, this middle one shows the same situation with leather. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that these holes are starting to become oval. They originally were round, uh, and now they're becoming oval because that's what this buckle tongue is doing. In a leather harness, that round hole has never mattered. It's always just uh, formed itself around that buckle tongue. But you see on the bottom slide now, here's a, a picture of this synthetic strap that's probably a couple of years old, and you begin to see the deterioration that's been caused. This was originally a round hole. It wants to be oval because of the way this tongue is going through it. Uh, the tip of this buckle tongue is not round, actually. It's oval. So we're trying to take this oval shape into a round hole. It doesn't stretch. It rips and tears. And you begin to see way over here on the left little places where it started to tear and rip. Now, fortunately, this synthetic material has a woven nylon core, so it hasn't really lost much strength at all. But it's also not very attractive. Uh, these two straps are approximately the same age. Another choice you're going to have uh, as you decide which harness to use is whether to use black or russet leather. And yes, synthetics now come in brown. Uh, it's not quite as attractive as russet leather, but they, there are black and brown synthetics. And in fact, there's uh, synthetics of practically any color you want. As I was researching for this webinar, I even came across a harness for a mini that had colored crystal sparkle inserts instead of patent leather. So you can you, you can get pretty much whatever you want. Um, black is considered appropriate with uh, painted vehicles uh, with shaft and pole trimmings done in black. It is also considered appropriate with a natural wooden vehicle with iron parts that are painted any color except brown. Shaft and pole trimmings, dash, and fenders uh, would be done in black. Russet harness is considered appropriate with a natural wood vehicle with brown or black iron parts painted vehicle with natural wood panels of any color iron or a vehicle that is painted brown with brown iron shaft and pole trimming should match the harness. And here we see some examples here. The top uh, left hand uh, photograph is a picture of the horse that won the World Singles in 2002. It's a nice russet turnout and a bay horse and a painted vehicle. Uh, I believe if we could see the rest of this vehicle we'd see that it had natural wooden panels on it. So presented a very nice picture. Um, contrast that to this slide over here, on a photo over here on the right. Um, there's a black harness on a chestnut horse with a, basically a brown turnout here. And I, in, to my mind, this would have been a perfect place to use a russet harness. It would have tied in very nicely with the whole color scheme, but it doesn't look too bad in black. The bottom left here, we have a uh, russet harness 
with a natural vehicle with black on the shafts. And to my eye, I would much prefer to see uh, this shaft leather here be russet also. Would have been a nice picture. Here on the right-hand side is a black harness with a dark, dark chestnut horse and a dark painted vehicle, and it looks very nice. And I think if you were to put a russet harness on this particular turnout, it would uh, be a little bit jarring to the eye. You will also be faced with a choice of metal for the buckles and other metal fittings on your harness. Generally, uh, the choice is between brass and chrome, but sometimes uh, stainless, even gold plate or silver plated fittings are used. Uh, this top right hand uh, photograph here is a silver plated harness, very fancy. Um, one of the nicest harnesses I've ever seen was a 100 year old russet harness with silver plated fittings uh, and with some of the fittings lined with ivory. Absolutely gorgeous, probably beyond uh, the scope of today's harness makers. Um, the picture over here on the left is a chrome plated uh, harness, nice and shiny. The only problem with chrome is it does tend to deteriorate a little bit over time. It can chip and, uh, and rust a little bit. In any event, the vehicle and the harness hardware should match. So if you have brass fittings on your vehicle, you should have brass fittings on your harness. Uh, if you have chrome fittings on your vehicle, you should have chrome fittings on your harness. Brass takes a little bit more effort to maintain, but it looks done when it, uh, it looks great when it's done right. Um, brass may not always be as strong as other materials, uh, so you have to be a little bit careful and examine it closely to make sure that you're getting high quality brass fittings. Uh, the content of various brass mixtures can vary tremendously, so you have to be very careful when you look at brass fittings and make sure they're high quality. Uh, stainless is great. It's very strong. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive. Uh, it certainly has a place where strength is really needed, like for combined driving trace shackles, for instance, which are subject to a lot of abuse. The choice of buying new or used harness should be considered very carefully. Good quality harness often holds its value very well if it's well cared for. So while it may be less than it uh, costs you less than the equivalent new harness, it may still be selling for close to what it sold for originally when it was new. Basically you get what you pay for. If the used harness that you're looking at is cheap, then buyer beware. It may not be safe or you may be very fortunate and be in the right place at the right time. But generally speaking, um, you do get what you pay for. Uh, if you're not experienced, in buying used harness or using harness, uh, buy from a reputable dealer or seek a knowledgeable person to help you. One thing that you can't see when you buy a used harness is the stress in the stitching that may have been uh, caused if the harness has been in a wreck. Sometimes that's very hard to see uh, and you will never really truly know. So proceed with caution. Never buy a harness that you cannot physically see or touch unless you are absolutely sure uh, of the reputation of the seller. Your life may depend on it. Another disadvantage to used harness is that usually you have to take it as it comes with no ability to swap out parts uh, that may or may not fit your horse. With a new harness, the seller will likely be very willing to substitute bigger or smaller parts as needed to best fit your horse. There are many, many types of harness and, and styles and variations within those types, but basically they can be broken down into the following types, and I'll show you examples of all these in later slides. Uh, recreational harness need not be real fancy. All it needs to do is be safe and be serviceable. Uh, that's a good place for a used harness uh, as long as it's in good condition. Pleasure competition uh, harness would be finer than a combined driving harness, perhaps with some patent leather parts strong enough for medium duty use. Combined driving harness is going to be a heavier duty harness with wider and thicker strapping, maybe more padding. Uh, for lower levels, if you can generally get by with one harness, but as you move up in the levels of combined driving, you're probably going to want to have two harnesses, one for the marathon phase and one where uh, for the fancier presentation phases. In distance driving, comfort is a must. It's got to fit well. Uh, it doesn't have to look great. 
but it has to fit well, it has to be comfortable, it has to be a good fit because that horse is going to be using it for a long time, wearing it for a long time. It's going to be on them, you know, basically all day. Uh, training harness uh, will be more flex will have more flexibility in the way it can be adjusted. Uh, may have some auxiliary rings and things placed on it so that uh, the trainers can set uh, training devices on it. Um, it's probably going to be a very heavy duty harness because it's going to get used over and over again. My training harness goes, as I said, on six or eight horses a day. It's pretty heavy duty. Uh, doesn't look great, but it works really well. And then you have uh, draft harnesses for specifically designed for draft work. They're very heavy duty. And I'm going to show you pictures of all of these. Okay, so the competition harnesses here, if you look at the top left-hand picture, it's a very simple, understated harness. Uh, it fits really well. The collar fits beautifully. The saddle fits nice and close. Uh, I can't really tell in this picture, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was a treeless saddle, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later. But it's a very nice, clean look. There's no bridging to interfere with the uh, picture. There's this might be used where the quality and elegance of the turnout is judged. It would not be used where strength and durability were primary concerns, such as in the marathon phase of a combined driving event. Every vehicle must have some mechanism for braking, and since uh, bridging is not used, which would be serving as the braking mechanism in this uh, particular turnout, the, this vehicle has a foot-operated brake, so the bridging is not required. Nevertheless, this setup would be more appropriate on more or less level ground like a dressage uh, ring, and in fact, that's where this picture was taken. On the bottom left, you see the almost identical carriage and turnout as the uh, top left, only this one has uh, breaching in it. And you'll notice how it adds a little bit more clutter to the eye when you look at it. Not quite as clean and neat. But still, it was good enough to win the presentation award and the individual bronze medal at the World Singles Championship in 2002 for Fred Merriam and his Morgan Gatewood Lightweight. So it's a, it's a very nice turnout. Uh, but I thought it was interesting to see the, the difference in how it affects the eye when you look at it. The top right-hand side, you have a heavy-duty marathon harness. And you'll note the wide pad on the back here. Whoops, sorry. Hang on. Sorry, it's my fault. I hit the wrong button. Uh, you'll notice right here this nice wide pad here is there for a reason. It's to keep this shaft, end of this shaft, from poking into the side here. Uh, but if you look everywhere else on this harness, you'll see it's a nice big heavy wide breast collar here, nice big wide girth here. All the strapping is a little bit bigger and heavier and slightly thicker to withstand the rigors of the job of combined driving. On the bottom right, we have a nice light, uh, light to medium duty pleasure driving harness for the pleasure uh, show ring. A little bit of patent leather here on the breastplate. as patent leather on the saddle. You can't really see it here. Patent leather blinkers. That's a nice, fancy, uh, medium duty pleasure driving harness. Uh, generally finer overall than a combined driving harness. Here's a couple of the styles of harness. You see the training sur single on the left here, and you notice all these auxiliary rings. Those are used for uh, attaching reins in various different positions uh, for training the horse. This is a distance harness on the right. <laughs> it's very well padded, as you can see. He's even got some sun protection here for his horse. Uh, this, this guy's done a lot of work to make sure that his horse is, is very comfortable. Not fancy, but it gets the job done. And uh, here we have the draft style harness. Uh, you'll uh, needs to be very, very heavy duty, like this uh, work harness on this moose here. Uh, if you look at the bottom left, you'll notice that the uh, harness for these fire horses has no saddle. Uh, that was done for a reason. This harness needs to be put on the horse in a hurry. Uh, so they stripped it down to the bare essentials. Uh, that's all it was required to get the job done, and that's the whole point is that the style of your harness has to fit the job that uh, you're asking it to do. On the bottom right here, you see a draft horse for a, 
uh, I mean, a draft harness for a racing draft horse. They race these horses in Japan. It's a heavy-duty harness, but again, if you look at it pretty closely, you'll see it's stripped down to its bare essentials. Uh, bridle is just about as simple as you can get. Uh, collar, a set of traces, something around the girth, and that's basically it. When it comes to sizing the, your harness uh, for your horse, most dealers will have uh, a diagram that they would like you to fill out, uh, and some measurements that they want you to take. Um, while there are basic sizes commonly used in sizing harness like mini, pony, uh, cob, horse, and draft sizes, those really are just starting points, and some parts may have to be swapped in or out of the package so that it fits your uh, horse or pony as best they can. And dealers are very used to doing this, um, very used to swapping parts in and out. But the better you can measure it, the uh, less swapping of parts that will need to take place. But don't be afraid to ask to get it right. Uh, like I say, dealers are accustomed to doing this. Each dealer has a slightly different way of measuring uh, for your horse, so listen to what they tell you to do and um, they'll be very happy to work with you. Ponies are probably the most problematic in this regard because the smaller the equine the more critical the fit becomes. A quarter of an inch difference in a, in a strap on a draft horse is hardly noticeable but on a mini it can be critical and can mean the difference between a good fit and one that's not right. So let's talk a little bit about the various uh, harness parts, specific harness parts. Like harnesses that can, are sold in, in common sizes, bridles are also sold in common sizes like uh, pony size, uh, cob size, horse size, warm blood size, or draft size. But it's generally much more practical to deal with the actual measurements, uh, especially with ponies, as I said, since there is a smaller tolerance for error in the fit. And like other harness parts, our harness parts expect to go back and forth with the dealer to get things just right. The brow band should be long enough to lie comfortably and not keep the crown piece from sitting far enough behind the ears to be comfortable. If we look at our friend here, John Henry the mule, you'll see that this crown piece just starts to pinch the back of his ear here, so maybe this brow band could stand to be a little bit longer to allow that to slip back there just a little bit. The crown piece can be straight or curved uh, and should lie well back behind the ears. This has to be comfortable for your horse. And, uh, it may not seem like much, but just making that little bit comfortable behind the ears can make the, uh, all the difference between a happy horse and one that's not quite got his full attention on the job. And I'll show you the difference between a, a, a curved crown piece and a straight one in, a, in the next slide. When fitting blinders, uh, the eye should be right in the center of the blinder here, and we have a good setup here. This eye is right dead center in the eye. It should lie snug, uh, fit to the face. You can open and close these blinders for more or less vision. Some horses uh, get very claustrophobic when those blinders are too close to their eye, and some horses uh, kind of see too much and are actually go better when their vision's restricted a little bit. Um, a little tip here, uh, I would, I always trim the uh, eyelashes of my driving horses so that that eyelash isn't being, isn't tickling the eye because it's rubbing on the inside of that blinder. Uh, again, it's just another way to make my horse a little bit more comfortable. I don't trim them off flush, but I, I trim them short enough so that they're not tickling uh, the eye. The shape of the blinder will be dictated by personal preference and by the style of the vehicle and harness that you're using. Uh, blinderless bridles can be used. Uh, they're not uh, illegal for ADS competitions, so use them if they work for you and your horse. I personally don't use them. I start uh, all my horses in an open bridle and then they move to a closed bridle and from that point on they uh, almost always go in a closed bridle unless I have some real problem. I've only had one horse in training in 35 years that I've actually tried an open uh, bridle on because he was having some problems. Didn't solve his problem. 
he went okay in it, but it didn't really solve his problem. But I've always used uh, blinder bridles, and I've never gotten in trouble with them. Your mileage may vary on that score. The cavus and her nose band uh, can be a separate or integral part of the bridle. Sometimes it's built in. I'll show you an example of that. In this case, we have a separate uh, uh, nose band. This has a hanger strap that goes all the way up and around down the other side. It also, uh, the, the hanger strap slides up or down so it can be positioned underneath this cheekbone uh, appropriately. Uh, initially, the height of this nose band should be placed about the width of your thumb below this cheek bone. Uh, it's, some horses don't have a lot of room between the corner of their mouth and this cheekbone, so there's not a lot of room to place this nose band. It's one of the few areas where there's a pretty radical difference from horse to horse of the same size. Uh, may have a slightly different uh, measurement from here to here. Generally, I like to place this nose band higher rather than lower. If it starts to get too low, then it starts to interfere when you activate this bit, and it can actually pinch. Very seldom do I see these nose bands adjusted too high, but frequently I see them adjusted way too low. They should be well padded uh, all the way around. Um, you have to remember that underneath the jawbone here, uh, there's not a lot of padding. It's just skin on top of bone. And this is one of the cases where this strap almost always goes in the same spot every time you put it on. And if it's not comfortable for the horse and you start to really crank on that nose band, horses get very uh, resentful of that and you'll see them start to resist uh, you when you go to put that bridle on or when you go to tighten this nose band up. When you first bridle the horse, just put this nose band in. Don't tighten it up all the way. Just get it on there, get it loose, and keep going about your business, getting the horse ready. As you're about to leave to leave your stable to go out and drive, then make your final adjustment. Doesn't have to be tight. Shouldn't be tight. There's only a few situations where that nose band needs to be snug down as tight as you can get it. Uh, but for most purposes, uh, it should be just snug. You should be able to get your fingers in there. The throat latch, which is this piece here, uh, needs to be loose enough to allow the horse to breathe when his head is completely flexed. Uh, so you should be able to get more than several fingers in there. Uh, its only purpose really is to hold this bridle on the horse's head and keep it from coming off over the ears. There is an auxiliary strap called a gullet strap that runs from underneath the jaw under underneath here from the throat latch to the nose band. I'll show you an example of that. That can also be used to help keep that bridle on the horse's head if he starts to rub. If you have a horse who has very low set forward ears, then losing this bridle over his ears can be a problem and a gullet strap's a pretty good fix for it. Uh, if you have a horse that likes to rub on things, uh, you may want to use a gullet strap to keep that bridle on his head. The height of the bit in the horse's mouth, um, there are lots of ways to, to set that. The standard way is to have one or two wrinkles right here, and you can see he's got one wrinkle there. That's probably enough. Different horses will go differently. Some like it a little lower. Some like it a little bit higher. Uh, the way I adjust the bit is I stand right in front of the horse. I pull down, straight down on the uh, with one hand on each side of the bit, I pull straight down and engage and seat the crown piece on top of his head. Then I take the bit and lift up just a little bit and see when I start to meet resistance. And when I meet a little bit of resistance, I look right here where the bit connects to the bridle and see how much play I have right here. Uh, if I have about a half an inch of play, uh, that's usually about right. And experience will tell you uh, what's going to be too much and what's not enough. But that's how I do it. I don't necessarily do it by the wrinkles in the mouth. You'll find another place where horse's conformation differs greatly on the same size horse is the size of their mouth. Uh, some horses are very short-lipped. The corner of their mouth can be way down here somewhere. And the bits are going to fit in those kind of mouths a little bit differently. John Henry here has a nice, big, healthy mouth. <laughs> nice, big, healthy ears, too.
Okay, so on the top here we have a straight crown piece. This is cut straight right behind the ears. This brow band is long enough to allow this crown piece to sit well behind the ear so it's not pushing forward and, and pinching on the back side of this ear. The bottom left we have a, a, a shaped crown piece. This is round right through here so it accommodates the back of the ear. Uh, brow band lengths are is often too short. Uh, this curved uh, shaped crown piece allows for that crown to be set placed well behind the ears. Some conformations of horses will benefit by this kind of crown piece. The placement of the ear on a horse's head differs from horse to horse. It kind of looks the same, but when you really get down to it, it can be quite different from horse to horse. This top right, again, we have John Henry. This is a completely custom-made synthetic bridle with chrome fittings. Uh, it's a little hard to get an idea about how big this bridle is in this picture, but his ears are over 12 inches long. So if you take that as 12 inches and start to measure down here, you begin to see this bridle is almost three feet long. <laughs> Here's the picture of the gullet strap on the bottom. Uh, runs. What we're looking at is we're looking upwards from on the underside of the horse. Here, this is the nose band, the bottom of the nose band on the underside of the horse's head. This is the throat latch as it comes underneath behind the mandible here. Uh, it's not adjusted tight, but it is uh, snug enough, and this will help you keep that bridle on the horse's head should he start to rub or should he have that confirmation of the uh, very low set forward ear. Okay, so we come to one of my pet peeves here. Many carriage driving bridles come with a nose band that's set up something like this. It's not separate from the bridle at all. It's built in. It has a little slot through here. And in this picture, it's adjusted correctly. The cheekbone is, is behind this buckle. Actually, I'd like to see this down a little bit lower. That buckle is rubbing right on that cheekbone. But in terms of up and down, it's positioned in about the right place it would be about a thumb width below the point of that cheekbone. And it works well in here because we have a long uh, distance from the mouthpiece to where it connects to the bridle. But now imagine if this same bridle was on a loose ring snaffle. So this would be the loose ring here. The leather would come all the way down to here. Now we have the problem of this tapered horse's head allowing this nose band to slip down, slip down, slip down until it stops where it meets the top of this bit. Now this nose band is down way too far on the horse's face and starts to interfere with the corner of the mouth and the front edge of the nose band. So that nose band is going to be down here somewhere. When you activate this bit, this is going to collapse and start to pinch. That's why I prefer to personally prefer to have a uh, cavison or nose band that is hung from a strap. And here we have uh, at the top right this strap would go up over the top of the horse's head, come down the other side, and it would allow me to raise or lower this nose band and position it on the horse's face regardless of the size bit I had in the horse's, or the size of the cheek on that bit. Uh, this one also has this ability to slide here so I can position this hanger strap exactly where I want it on the side of the horse's head. Uh, very much like this. Uh, this particular nose band has an additional padding underneath the jaw, uh, which is a great idea. Some of them don't, and I found a very quick and dirty solution for that, and that is to use a rubber curb guard. Uh, these are for curb chains, uh, and you'll find that this 99-cent rubber curb guard can fit on this strap right through here and give you a little bit of extra cushion on that very sensitive area underneath the horse's jaw right here. So that's my pet peeve about nose bands. Now we come to the collar. We have the uh, choice here of a breast collar or a full collar. Or now lately we've started to see some combination collars. This is a breast collar here. It's probably the most common. It fits the wide variety of horses. It's very easy to go from one horse to the next. Uh, in my training situation, I use a, a breast collar and it goes on, the same breast collar can go on a 14-hand horse or a 16-hand horse uh, very easily with minor adjustment. If I was to do the same with a full collar, which we see down here on, again, on John Henry, 
I'd have to have two or three or four or five different sizes of collars to fit every horse that I have working in the course of a day. Uh, and so the breast collar is a much simpler affair. The, the pros of the breast collar is that it's easy to fit and adjust from horse to horse. It's suitable for lightweight vehicles. When you start to get into heavier vehicles, then you're going to want to go to a full collar. But for lightweight vehicles like a road cart or a Meadowbrook, a breast collar works just great. The downside is it may unduly interfere with the freedom of the shoulder movement, and I'm going to show you some of that in a minute. Um, it should fit above the point of the shoulder right here and below the base of the neck right here. So there's plenty of room in this particular horse to fit, but not all horses are built that way, uh, and they may benefit from a collar that's shaped more like this one here on the bottom right, where we have uh, the point of the shoulder here, the base of the neck here, not a whole lot of room for this to fit. This is called an empathy collar. It's kind of a cross between a full collar in the sense that the draft is way up here, well above the shoulder. Here, this would be the trace that goes back to the vehicle. So he's actually pulling from way up here as opposed to the breast collar, uh, straight breast collar, which would be pulling from down here. So he gets a little more freedom of movement. This French collar, uh, similar type affair. It's kind of a full collar, kind of a breast collar. It's kind of half and half. Uh, the downside of the full collars is they're more complicated to fit. Uh, it takes a bit of experience to be able to fit them exactly right. And the other problem is your horse is constantly changing. He's developing muscling. He's maybe developing as he's growing. And the collar that fit him last week may not fit him next week. Here we see... Uh, breast collar and a full collar on essentially the same turnout. I just happened to stumble on these two slides on the internet. Uh, this was a very, actually a very common type of turnout. Very easy for elderly people to get in and out of. It's kind of like a four-wheeled horse-drawn wheelchair. But if we think about the breast collar, breast collar is very suitable for a uh, draft that's in a straight line. Okay, so it's going to go on a straight shaft vehicle like a road cart or a metal brook. Full collar is probably more suitable because uh, f for situations where the draft is coming more from the axle uh, to the middle of the shoulder. Very, very efficient way to pull. Um, it's not pulling down on the shoulder nearly as much as a breast collar would be if it was hooked to the axle. So if you imagine going from here down to here, you'd be pulling down on the front edge of that shoulder, so uh, you would very much be restricting the movement of the horse's shoulder. In this bottom picture here, we actually have a full collar, but the trace, you'll notice, is going straight back up high. Uh, so that's not really ideal. If this trace was coming back down here more towards the front end of this vehicle, we'd have a much more efficient uh, pulling mechanism. A couple more pictures of breast collars. Uh, I know this is going to catch your eye here. The point of this shaft here is going to be digging right into this horse's shoulder. Uh, this was just a, a setup shot um, used to demonstrate the breast collar, not so much about the uh, uh, appropriate management of the end of the shaft here. So that's why it's set up this way. The reason I like this particular picture is it starts to point out um, the problem that exists sometimes with the neck turrets that are uh, put on the hanger straps of the breast collar, quite often you see them mounted up too high and too close together, and what happens is you uh, break the line of the rein coming from the driver's hand. This has a nice direct line from the driver's hand through the saddle turret, through the neck turret to the horse's mouth, very uninterrupted. Sometimes these neck turrets get up so high they start to influence the way that horse can carry his head and neck. Uh, and this breast collar here on the right, you see these turrets are nice and wide apart. That's probably going to work for quite a number of horses, but I've seen them as close as four inches together up here on top, and that's just not going to work. On the bottom right, you see the problem of the breast collar being above the point of the shoulder, but 
it can't be below the base of the neck. It starts to impinge here on the base of the neck. It starts to interfere. This problem would be solved by a drop front or a shaped collar, which comes down in front. So it's able to get up here above the point of the shoulder, but here below the base of the neck. So that would be a very appropriate use for the uh, drop front collar. But even here, you can start to see these neck turrets are starting to get a little bit close together. And I'm going to show you the effect in a couple of slides, I think, of making that adjustment when we talk about tweaking the harness. Harness saddles, you basically have the, uh, the, uh, the tree over the top or a treeless saddle, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a second, the girth and the tugs. The front edge of this saddle uh, should be placed about the width of your hand behind the last hairs of the base of the mane. That's a pretty good starting point. It's about four inches from the last hairs on the mane. Uh, fits well behind the withers. If it's much farther forward than that, it starts to interfere with the withers. Uh, it is probably the most common misadjustment that I see made um, on horses and ponies is that saddle is placed too far forward. When the horse is standing at rest, when you're hooking that horse, putting, tacking up that horse for the first time, you want to make sure that saddle is well back. When he starts to, when he starts to work, that saddle is going to want to come forward just a little bit. So place it a little bit farther back than you think it's going to end up, and you should be about right. The girth should be snug, but not nearly as tight as a riding girth. Uh, there's no need to yank up on that girth and keep it absolutely tight. That horse needs to breathe and needs to be able to open his chest and flex his ribs. Uh, so it doesn't need to be tight. The girth should be positioned well back from the elbow so it doesn't interfere when that horse is moving. Uh, so it's not right up snug behind the front leg. It's back a little bit so that horse can... Uh, move his elbow without interfering with the saddle. Uh, you can use a pad on your girth there. There's some horses that are very sensitive underneath there. Again, there's not a lot of muscle underneath there for padding. Some horses are very sensitive, and a pad is perfectly appropriate to use on the, on the girth. Uh, the tugs, we have several different types of tugs and their placement, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute. We have the debate that I hear constantly about the treeless versus the tree saddle. Uh, I use a treeless saddle, um, and basically what we're talking about here is the tree is a piece of metal that is inside the top of the saddle. It would be right up in here, uh, and the saddle turrets are screwed into that metal tree, and it forms a nice stiff supporting uh, platform for all this hardware. The treeless saddle has nothing in there. This is a treeless saddle. There's nothing inside it. There's no metal. What I like about it is that I'm able to distribute any weight that's in these tugs over a very wide area from actually halfway uh, up the side of the horse all the way up over the top, this full width. Uh, that's a huge uh, amount of square inches that I'm able to distribute the weight of these shafts here. Uh, the one caution for a treeless saddle is that it has to have a little bit of room here, a little bit of padding. You can't see it because it's behind this strap, but there's a little opening here for the horse's spine. Poorly made treeless saddles do not have that, and they are not good for your horse. But I have used this this basic harness here. My training harness is an adaption of this. I've used it on six or eight horses a day, six days a week for 35 years, and I have never caused the back problem on my horses because of the treeless saddle. I like the look of this treeless saddle for this show harness here. It's nice low profile. It fits nice and tight to the horse. And I don't think I've ever gone to a competition where somebody hasn't come up to me and asked me where I got it because they like the way that it looks. I see much more problem with horses' backs created with this situation here on the bottom left. This is a, a tree saddle. What we're looking at is we're looking at the edge of the tree up in, here's the back strap here. You're looking right along the edge of the pad that would go on the horse's back. So basically we're looking from here up to here on the underside of this uh, saddle. And this is the profile. It's round like this. 
and all the pressure on this saddle is concentrated in a very narrow area here. So even though this back of this saddle may be four inches wide, all the pressure is right here on only an inch. Contrast that to this saddle here, this treeless saddle, which is four or five inches wide. Uh, we're able to distribute the weight in a much, much broader area. So I see much more damage caused by this kind of situation than this. Uh, this is a treed saddle here. Um, He's, this horse has a little pad on there because it doesn't really fit the horse's back all that well. It's very difficult sometimes to shape that metal tree to fit that horse's back. Uh, and in fact, right through here, underneath this pad, that saddle isn't even touching the horse right there. So all the weight of this vehicle is in an area about this big, about two by six inches underneath this pad, as opposed to here, which is four by 15. So that's my spiel on, on treeless versus treat saddles. The tug is the harness part that keeps the shaft from falling on the ground. By tug, we're talking about this piece right here. And it's holding up the shaft, keeping it from falling on the ground. With a straight shaft vehicle, such as we see here, it is generally adjusted so that the tip of the point of the uh, tip of the shaft is at the point of the shoulder, right here and the shaft is sloped downward slightly from the tip back towards the rear. With curved shaft vehicles, that may vary a little bit. Some of the gigs uh, have a big curve on the front of their shaft, and uh, that point on those curved shafts may be in a slightly different spot. The technical aspects of balancing a vehicle are too detailed to get into here, but generally speaking, for two-wheeled vehicles, when there are uh, two people seated in the vehicle, there should be hardly any weight on that tug. For four-wheeled vehicles, you would only have the weight of the shaft and uh, itself in that tug, so it's really not an issue. There are several types of tugs. The most common is the English or open tug uh, that we see here. This is English tug, open tug. Uh, allows for the shaft to float inside it and move back and forth a little bit. Uh, as the horse moves uphill, downhill, um, you, it counts for that movement. It is uh, used with most two-wheel vehicles with straight shafts. French tugs, which we see here, are suitable for curved shaft vehicles, which are difficult to balance on their own and may need to be held in place. This would be uh, these would be uh, the shaft will go through here. This would get pulled down and tightened around that shaft, and it would keep things nice and snug and in place. Tilbury tugs are very similar to French tugs, and they're used on a four-wheeled single horse vehicles. Um, the other variation of all these are the quick release tugs, which you see here. This is a quick release tug in the middle. Um, the, hey, there's my telephone. Uh, this is a quick release tug. It is called quick release because we can pull this strap out and this tug opens up and the shaft comes out. Uh, it's, you find it on uh, combined driving harnesses. Uh, and the reason you find it on combined driving harnesses is off of the end of the shaft is a closed loop shaft like this. So the only way to get this uh, connection here is to open this up and put it in this loop and then close it back up. But it's also good in combined driving if you have an accident or get hung up somewhere, it's very quick and you can uh, open it up and, and get your vehicle disattached from your horse. I use it on my training vehicle. I never know what kind of uh, situation, on my training harness, I never know what kind of situation I'm going to get into. Uh, so I like to have the ability to have that uh, quick release if necessary. Now the other the other part of the uh, last last part of the harness is the bridging and the back strap. We're talking uh, about here's your back strap here. Here's the bridging that hangs off of it. The back strap really is, uh, the only function is to provide the architecture to hang the bridging and a little bit to keep the saddle in place. This this crupper here will keep the saddle from riding too far forward. Uh, but surprisingly enough, uh, if you don't use a crupper, this saddle will stay pretty much in place on most horses. Uh, there are some confirmations where that would not be true. Occasionally you find a horse that really wants to clamp his tail around a crupper, really objects to having a crupper under his tail, and there is this uh, device here called a, a spider backstrap. 
the this would be where the set it attaches to the saddle here it goes back in a y over the butt of the horse and the crupper were there to be one would be sitting right here these straps would hang the bridging around the butt of the horse so there's no crupper uh, i've used these they stay uh, right in place they're uh, the bridging is balanced and hung correctly uh, they work great uh, it's really a draft horse thing. You see it on a lot of draft horse harnesses, but it also works for carriage driving without any problem. Uh, the crupper you use should be smooth and well-shaped for the area underneath the tail. Uh, if you think about it, that skin underneath the tail is very thin and very sensitive. It should be kept absolutely clean so you don't develop any rubs or sores there. Once you get a rub or a sore there, then your horse is going to get very reluctant to have you putting that crupper underneath his tail. For horses that clamp their tail uh, around the crupper, I found that if you use one of these fatter cruppers like this one here, or you can wrap the crupper with uh, vet wrap uh, and make it a little bit thicker, uh, sometimes they're less likely to really clamp that tail down because they can't get it down around there tight. It also helps for horses who have the uh, propensity to flip their tail over the rein. If you have a big fat crupper underneath there, you they don't panic quite so much when that happens. The bridging takes more adjustment than practically any other harness part to get exactly right. Standing on cross ties as you're tacking your horse up, that bridging may look like it's set perfectly. When you go out to work, you find that it's a little bit too high or a little bit too low. It should be the below the point of the buttock here, below the point of the buttock. Uh, but high enough not to interfere with the hind leg movement. Um, here you see that it's just down a little bit too low and it's starting to interfere with the hind leg movement here. This adjustment could be corrected by shortening this strap right here. Probably a hole would be all that's necessary to lift that up an inch or so and get it up where it belongs. This one here, obviously, it's it's set down way too low. It's also a little bit short. This ring here should fit right about at the stifle. This would be about right. It should hang down right about at the stifle. Here, bottom right, you see this ring is right about at the stifle. That should be about right. This is going to be a little bit short. It's already short down here. If this is up where it belongs, that ring is going to be up in here somewhere. Uh, you should be able to put a fist between the bridging and the horse when you're on level ground and you uh, put your carriage in draft. This bridging should not be tight. The horse needs to be able to move this hind leg there. So there needs to be uh, loose enough so that horse has freedom of movement to move his hind leg. I'm sorry, we're going the wrong way. There we go. I want to talk a little bit about a kick strap. Uh, I use a kick strap on every horse, every drive, every time at home. Uh, it's the best insurance I can buy, 35 bucks, and it's saved my life many, many times. A kick strap works here. We're looking at the hind end view of the horse. Here's the kick strap right here, this strap here running up over the uh, hind end of the horse. It goes around the shaft on this side, up over the horse's butt, down to the shaft on this side. It needs to be loose so that horse can move uh, normally when everything is, is right. The way it functions is when that horse wants to kick or buck or lift up its hind end, it meets resistance on this strap and is prevented from lifting its hind leg so it keeps its leg from going over the shaft. It can be integrated into a new or, uh, an existing harness or a new harness to be unobtrusive. If you look at some old diagrams of harnesses, you'll see that they were built right in uh, and they look fine. They're very unobtrusive. Um, if you're going to use one in a competition, they're not illegal, uh, but it should look like it belongs to your harness. Uh, so if you have a brass harness with brass fittings, your kicking strap should have brass fittings too. If you have a leather harness, you should have a leather kicking strap. It needs to be unobtrusive. Uh, you should be able to attach it quickly. If you see here, uh, this is from my training harness. This part, lower part, stays on the shaft all the time. 
this part stays on the harness all the time. When I'm going to hook the horse up, I just take this piece here and snap it to this ring, and it's it's all done. If it's too complicated to connect, you're not going to lose it. Uh, use it. Uh, I even find this buckle here to be too much uh, for my taste. So I, I hook six or eight horses in a day, and I just don't like doing that buckle all the time. Snap works great for me. I don't like to see him placed back so far as this one here. If this horse starts to buck or, or kick, what's going to happen is it's, start gonna, it's gonna start to pull that crupper underneath his tail, uh, and he's not gonna like that. Um, so it's gonna uh, induce him to be more uncomfortable. I like to see it a little farther forward up over the, the, the hips of the horse. It'll work just as fine here to keep that horse from getting a leg over the shaft, and it won't pull on that crupper. Okay, so tweaking the harness. Don't be afraid to alter your equipment to make life easier and more pleasant for your horse. Anything you can do to improve the efficiency of the job is probably worth doing. Don't be afraid to experiment a little bit. Harness makers construct equipment based on a very on very general me uh, measurements. For instance, they place saddle turrets where they uh, based on where the holes are in the tree that they use, not necessarily on where the best position might be for your particular horse's conformation. Moving a saddle turret or a neck turret down an inch may make a huge difference in the way that horse carries itself. And I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about in the next slide. Uh, pads, ideally you should not try to make your horse's equipment fit by using pads. It should fit well without pads. But sometimes we don't have that luxury, and sometimes pads uh, are necessary to get the equipment to, to fit correctly. Fluffy pads uh, I don't like because they absorb sweat and water. I do like these uh, gator hide pads. They're a synthetic material. They don't absorb water. They're a lot easier to clean, um, and they cause a lot less problems. Uh, pads can increase retained body heat, so they have to be used with care. You have to pay attention to that. A poor fitting pad is worse than no pad at all. So if you're going to use pads, make sure they fit. Uh, make sure they stay in place while you're using them. Sometimes they look great when you leave the barn, and then halfway through your drive, you see they're starting to come off and starting to twist, and that's going to cause more problems. Uh, so a, a good fitting pad can be fine. A bad fitting pad can cause more problems than it's worth. Uh, pads may also not be appropriate when scores for turnout or presentation count. Uh, but don't be, a, don't be afraid to alter your equipment a little bit. You'll be surprised what you can accomplish. This um, middle picture here at the top, right here, uh, is a neck turret on my training saddle. And if you think about what uh, the rain would come through this turret here. And it will find it's uh, the level that it's going to work best at. It, this can move in a probably a three-inch half circle or so, and it'll go where it needs to go based on the conformation of the horse. Uh, so that's just one example of how you can uh, keep your equipment from interfering with the best performance of your horse. Here's a couple other examples of what I was talking about, changing a few things. Uh, this top left slide is a horse I had in a clinic uh, a year or so ago. Uh, and if you look carefully, you'll see he's braced the muscle on the underside of his neck. He's carrying his head up a little bit high. Uh, the saddle turrets here are very close together on this saddle. So what we did is we just took some cable ties here. and We made a couple of rings. And we lowered the line of the rein off this uh, turret here, and look at the change in the way this horse is carrying himself. He's given up using this muscle on the underside of his neck. He's going nice and long and low. His stride's considerably longer than it was. Uh, just a nice overall improvement, and all we did was lower this rein from this uh, saddle turret that was too high by maybe an inch and a half. Notice where this rein crosses underneath this neck strap here versus here much higher up here, much lower here. So where would you place the, the, the neck turret on this? Now this might be a little bit low. I'd probably put it right about here uh, if I had one. Here's an example, again, the same problem. Saddle turrets up close together, neck turrets up too high, and consequently we get this horse carrying his head and neck up much higher than he needs to be. Uh, if we were to lower this saddle turret down here just a little bit, 
uh, I can almost guarantee you'd see this rain crossing under the next strap about here. His head and neck carrots would be down and around here somewhere, and he'd be a much happier, much more efficient animal as a consequence. So don't be afraid to change things around. You know, if it, if you try it and it doesn't work, no problem. Put it back. Uh, but if you don't try it, you'll never find out. So this might be a good spot for any questions so far about harnessing. We've talked about that uh, before we get into bits. Susie, you got any questions? I have a whole bunch here. I bet um, you do. <laughs> they've been coming in in leaps and bounds. Um, is there a, a, an easy way to move the saddle turrets without having to, um, you know, employ a whole harness maker and everything? Right. Is there an easy way to well, do it? Yeah, uh, let's go back to this slide real quick. Uh, we're we're running a little long on time, but is yeah. that going to be okay, Susie? No, we'll go okay until they kick us off. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, you see this bolt right here? Uh, if you're lucky, uh, you can take this neck, uh, this saddle turret here, and unscrew it, and move it down here, and put this bolt in here. Not always. Um, Sometimes the threads on the bottom of these are exactly the same, and it's an easy fix. Sometimes it's not, uh, but that is one way to do it. Um, when I'm in a working situation, training situation, what I do, and I take them to the clinics all the time, I get the largest swivel snap that I can find at a hardware store. It's about four and a half inches long, and I snap it to the saddle turret, and I run my rein through the swivel end of it here, and I effectively drop the line of the rein uh, a good two or three inches, and that works real well. Um, I actually also have a, a saddle in my barn that has two sets of uh, saddle turrets. I just I took this bolt out and put another one in here. I've used it in a competition. I've never had a judge say anything about it. Of course, now they all will because they know I have it. But. <laughs> okay. Um, is there uh, any suggestions that you have for keeping a girth uh, back on a well-sprung horse. So a horse that's really pretty wide, how do you keep that all back instead of sliding forward? Well, that's a good, uh, I don't know of a mechanism that can actually physically hold it back, uh, but I would question the placement of the saddle on top. Um, you want to make sure that saddle on top is placed far enough back uh, so that that's not a problem. You could also uh, if you know if you're starting to get rubs on the elbow, you may want to adjust the size of that girth and shop around for one that's a little narrower or a little bit smaller. Just buy yourself another inch in that area. If you really have a problem with rubs, then I would cover it with a sheepskin. On the kicking strap, um, now does that normally attach to the footman loops, or is it just no. right on the shaft? Uh, in this picture, it's it's attached to this footman's loop. That's not really what that footman's loop is there for. It's just convenient. It happened to line up, so that's why they used it. Uh, on on this one here, you see it's just floating around the shaft. This is actually adjusted a little bit too tight, but it just floats here. When that horse is working, this is loose. Uh, there's no need to put it through any kind of uh, a ring or a, a footman's loop or anything like that. No, you don't need to. Do you think um, you should use a sliding back band for a two-wheeler? Um, is that really important or not, if you just have a cart versus a four-wheel vehicle? A sliding um, back band? It depends a little bit on the vehicle that you're using. Um, I use a road cart for training. I do not have a sliding back band. Uh, I've never had one in 35 years. I've never caused a problem. I live and work on a hill, so I'm always going side hill. Uh, I've never had a problem with it. Um, Certain vehicles that are are high and have a lot of tipping from side to side, you, know, you may want to use one. It just depends on the job you're going to use and the vehicle you have. I don't think it's particularly critical. Is there maybe an approximate measurement from the point of shoulder to the base of the neck that would indicate the need for a drop front breastplate? How would you judge if your horse needs to really use a, a drop front type breastplate? Well, let's go back here if we can find it. There. Um, I don't know, so you can do it by measurement. I think you uh, take your straight breast collar and put it on there and get it above the point of the shoulder and see what happens when you uh, at the neck. 
it's really trial and error. Every horse is, is built so differently, and you go from ponies to big horses. Uh, there's no way to really have a measurement. You just have to do it by trial and error. And probably our last question that we can take right now is, um, on a treeless saddle, uh, you mentioned that the weight is distributed over a wider area. But it seems that um, if you have a treeless saddle, it would allow the weight to rest directly on the withers or the spine versus a tree. Um, okay. How would you address that? Well, uh, let's see. Go back to this picture here. Again, you think about this round profile on this uh, saddle with a tree in it. Um, all the pressure is right here in this one inch, inch and a half across here. Um, it's a very, if you actually sit and look at your horse, it's an area that's maybe two inches wide by eight inches long. So all the weight is in that two, 16 square inch area. Uh, on this treeless saddle, the weight is distributed uh, on an area that's four inches wide by 15 inches long. That's 60 inches versus 16. So the pounds per square inch um, is, is much, much lower on this treeless saddle. There is an area on the top here to allow for the spine uh, so there's no pressure on it. And is that something that you'd look at for a quality treeless harness, is that it still has a bit of relief for the spine? Yes, you'd have to have this. If it doesn't have this relief on the spine, pass it by. That's going to cause problems. Okay. Okay. All right, let's carry on with... More bits, bits. and more bits. <laughs> more bits. Okay. There are two basic families of bits, the snaffle bits and the leverage bits, and we'll, I'll show you examples of those. Uh, there's lots of different mouthpieces. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different mouthpieces. Uh, there's dozens of different cheek pieces. There's hundreds of different kinds of materials that bits are being made of, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how to fit them. Uh, the bit is the gateway to the equine brain. Without an effective tool to communicate your instructions to your horse, your performance will suffer. Without the skill to effectively speak through your reins to your horse, your performance will also suffer and perhaps your life or your neighbor's lives will be at risk. Horses are not born with a bit in their mouth, and they are not born understanding what a bit is for. They must be trained to understand the language of the bit, and it cannot be done all at once. The refinement of the language of the bit is perhaps infinite. Understanding by your horse the subtleties of bit instruction or the bit language can, take, can and will take years. While training your horse to be, uh, should be fun and a rewarding process, you must be willing to take the education process seriously enough to be fair to your horse. He did not ask you to train him. He did not ask you to put a bit in his mouth. Heike Bean, in her very valuable book, Carriage Driving, A Logical Approach Through Dressage Training, put it this way. What does, it, what does it feel like to be this animal of flight who must submit to being strapped in a carriage, controlled through a piece of metal in his mouth, doing things and going places he would never dream of going on his own? Bits are not magic. They do not come with an automatic education. A $200 bit will not suddenly and magically deliver perfect tens on a dressage test. Your horse must be capable of appreciating what you put in his mouth and be capable of understanding the communication he receives through it. That takes skill on the part of the driver, and it is best learned with the help of someone who is experienced at teaching such things. It is very difficult to accurately put into words the feeling and timing of rain work. There are several books that explain bit theory and concept, but there is no substitute for the live action and a good teacher. Snaffle bit is a non-leverage bit. Non bit. Um, it consists of a mouthpiece with a ring on either side of some sort uh, with a snaffle, an ounce of pressure applied to the reins, uh, uh, applied by the reins uh, to the snaffle mouthpiece will apply one ounce of pressure on the mouth. It's direct pressure, the amount you 
take on the rein is what the horse feels in his mouth. A snaffle is not categorized by whether the mouthpiece does or do not, does not have joints in it. Uh, that seems to be a big misconception. We see it happen all the time. Bits are called uh, snaffles because the mouthpiece has a joint in the middle of it. A bit is a snaffle because it creates direct pressure leverage on the mouth. A single or double jointed mouthpiece, though the most common designs for snaffle bits, did not make it a snaffle bit. A mullen mouth or a solid slightly curved bar, that's what a mullen mouth is, or a bar bit, uh, can also be part of a snaffle. So it doesn't necessarily have to have a joint to be a snaffle. It can also be part of a leverage bit. We'll show you some examples of that. A snaffle is sometimes mistakenly thought of as a mild uh, of as any mild bit. While direct pressure without leverage is milder than pressure with leverage, nonetheless certain types of snaffle bits can be extremely harsh when manufactured with wire or twisted metal or other sharp elements to it. A thin or rough surface snaffle used harshly can damage a horse's mouth. Likewise, a big fat snaffle is not necessarily more comfortable in a horse. You can cause a lot of damage with a big fat snaffle if, if it's not right for that horse. And the leverage bit, the rein action, amplifies the pressure in the mouth by the leverage advantage. The leverage advantage places pressure on several places on the horse's head, the pole via the crown piece of the bridle, the chin groove via the curb, curb chain or curb strap, and the bars and tongue via the mouthpiece. The primary principle in selecting a bit is first use the bit that works. Then worry about what it looks like or whether it's proper. I'm often asked about having to use a, a riding bit for riding and a driving bit for driving. Use the bit that works. If he rides well in a certain bit, start there. Perhaps you can use a more traditional style driving bit uh, with the right mouthpiece in action once you get further along. But start with the bit that he goes you know, you already know he goes well with. So just because it's a riding bit does not necessarily mean it can't be used for driving. Uh, we'll talk about bitless bridles here in a minute. Well, a bridle with a bit is required for each horse in ADS competition, so you cannot use a bitless bridle. Uh, people have used them. I've used them. I've not been satisfied with it, not been real happy with it. Here you see a combined driving horse. This is a standard bred bridle. This particular horse had some mouth damage here, and that would probably be the only appropriate use for a bitless bridle, in my opinion, is a horse that had uh, bit da uh, mouth damage from a bit or some confirmation in his mouth that prevented him from uh, using a bit well. Um, Here's some examples of snaffle bits. Uh, there's all kinds. There's, this is just a small, small sampling of the ones that are out there. Um, I'd like you to be a little careful with bits labeled as Dr. Bristol bits. They come in many, many variations, some of which are just not correct. And they're simply made that way because an Asian bit manufacturer's machinery can only make it a certain way. And regardless of what kind of bit you use, it should be manufactured well. By that I mean it should be smoothly finished with no rough edges or places that could pinch the sensitive lips of your horse. They should also fit the interior of your horse's mouth well. Uh, with a few exceptions, the severity of any bit simply depends on the knowledge and hands of the person holding the reins. The subject of bit designs is, and function is deep and vast and can take an entire webinar of its own. So this is just a sample of uh, some of the snaff more common snaffles that are out there. Um, I should point out here the way you measure a size of a bit is you measure from the inside of the bit rings. So this would be a five inch bit here. Uh, so that's how you do it, from inside cheek to inside cheek. Here's some examples of uh, leverage bits all different kinds. This top one on the left here, I want to just draw your attention to. This is an abomination in my opinion. This bit will twist and turn and do very strange things in a horse's mouth. Uh, it is made this way because the bit manufacturer was already making this mouthpiece, so they said, well, what the heck, we can put it in there, we'll just put different cheeks on it, and now we have a different bit to, that we can sell. Almost, uh, I've almost never seen a bit like this work well in a horse's mouth. Uh, there's probably an exception out there. You put, there's probably somebody listening here who has a horse that goes great in there. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not likely. 
I'd also draw your attention to this uh, bar bit here, and one of the uh, problems I have with bar bits is um, I rarely see them work well. And the reason for that is uh, there is, a, a, when that bit is in the horse's mouth, there is always pressure on that horse's tongue. If you, if you put a bar bit in the horse's mouth, you peel back the lips and take a look in there, you will see that there is constant pressure on that horse's tongue. There is no way they can avoid it. There's no way to get away from it. There's no way to adjust that bit so that doesn't happen. And certain horses tolerate it, and they go pretty well uh, with it. but. Um, I dare say they'll be more comfortable in something like this, the uh, Glory Liverpool and Butterfly bits here. The primary uh, design concern here is this bit is, marched, is arched upwards and forwards and gives a lot of room for the tongue underneath that bar. It's a very comfortable bit when the rein is not activated. Uh, it has a, what I call a big reward zone. So when I release pressure on that rein, that bit goes to a very comfortable position in that horse's mouth. I will say if you use this bit, um, when you first put it on a horse, you may find that the horse flips his tongue over that bit fairly readily. The reason for that is uh, they find they have this newfound freedom of the tongue. There's no pressure on their tongue anymore. So they act to move their tongue a little bit more and experiment, and they accidentally flip their tongue over the bit. They're not flipping the tongue over the bit because they don't like it. There's just more freedom than they're used to. Uh, so if you use this bit and you see that happen, Give it a week or 10 days before you decide that it's not going to work. Uh, leverage bits should be adjusted so that when that rein is activated, the cheeks are at about 45 degree angle to the uh, cheek piece that hangs the, the bit. This is maybe a length too short, uh, but uh, it's pretty close. If you have it too loose, this bit will swing back too far here. Uh, that's not a good thing when you start to have uh, ports in your bit because that port's going to rise up against the pallet on the underside of the uh, inside the horse's mouth. Um, if it's too tight, the horse never has a chance to experience what this bit really is all about. It instantly grabs them. Uh, I will say one thing in my experience. Uh, these leverage bits, bits with a curb chain, have a tendency to grab onto a horse's face and not let go. When you release the rein on a Liverpool bit, that bit doesn't release quite the same way as it does uh, with uh, uh, a snaffle bit. We'll talk a little bit about mouthpieces here. Uh, you basically have two different kinds of mouthpieces. You have the single bar, one piece mouth, and you have the multi piece mouth. Multi-piece can be anywhere from two to 25 pieces. I've even seen pieces of chain used as a mouthpiece. Uh, but those are the two basic families, single bars. And in the single bar family, you have Mullen Arch, uh, the Glory Mouth we've already talked about, Straight Bar we've talked about. Um, I'll show you some examples of all of these. Uh, you saw some of these multiple piece mouths in the uh, slide with the snaffles on there. Here are some of the mouthpieces you'll see. Uh, there's just an almost an unlimited variation of how these things are put together. I'll draw your attention to this bit here on the bottom. This came from a manufacturer's catalog and it was labeled as a snaffle. And this is an example of what I was talking about. The reason they call it a snaffle is because it has this joint in the middle of it. Uh, and they mistakenly call that a snaffle. I don't generally think these Liverpool bits with a joint in them work very well. They start to twist and do funny things in a horse's mouth. Um, I'll just point out the difference here between an arch mouth and a mullen mouth. Arch mouth, uh, this uh, is arched upwards, uh, perpendicular to the, uh, or parallel to the uh, uh, cheeks on the on the bit. This is a mullen mouth that's arched forwards um, perpendicular to the cheek pieces. So this is parallel, this is perpendicular. The glory bit is halfway in between. It's arched upwards and forwards. Here are some of the uh, various cheek pieces you'll see out there. It's interesting to note this is the first bit that, was, uh, that man ever used. Um, they actually found one of these 
couple of pieces of antler, a piece of cord. It's the earliest bit they've ever found. And what I found was intriguing about that is it looks very, very similar to this full cheek snaffle, which is still in use, you know, today, thousands of years later. Um, you don't see the full cheek used in carriage driving much. This top cheek has been taken off and you end up with a half cheek. The reason this top cheek is taken off here is because this has a tendency to get hooked on various leather straps, so they've taken it off. The function of this cheek is to prevent the bit from getting pulled through the horse's mouth. Uh, that's one of the dangers you run into with a loose ring snaffle if you have to. If you're in a runaway situation, you have to turn that horse in a circle, uh, you run the risk of actually pulling this bit through the horse's mouth. So that's why we have the, uh, the half cheek. That wouldn't happen with a D-ring, uh, less likely to happen with an egg butt. Here's just a couple of oddball things uh, just to show you the wide variation here. We've already talked about the butterfly cheek, appropriately named because it looks like a butterfly. Uh, these are not allowed in ADS competitions. The rule reads uh, uh, no twisted wire burr bits or gag bits are allowed. This is a bit burr on the side. It's used for helping you to turn the horse. That's not allowed. These are examples of gag bit. This is a gag bit here. The reins would go on here. And the function of a, the action of a gag bit is when you pull on the rein, it lifts the bit up higher in the horse's mouth. Uh, these wire bits are not allowed. Here's one that's really not allowed. This is a uh, double twisted wire gag bit. If you can't stop them with that, you're in trouble. <coughs> Excuse me. Bit materials, there's an infinite variety of bit materials. They now actually come in pastel colors and uh, all kinds of flavors. Um, I'm not sure your horse really cares whether its bit is pink or purple or blue. Um, they come in lots of different metals and there's uh, you know, various theories and, and technical issues on why these particular combinations of metals work and don't work. Um, I, we don't have time to go into all of them now, just give you an example of how many there are. I do draw your attention to this latex. This is uh, the latex bandage. Its original use was to wrap uh, racehorse legs on a wet track. It doesn't absorb water. It's a latex rubber bandage that sticks to itself. So you can cut little strips of it and wrap it around uh, your bits to, to uh, give them a little more cushion. They work really well for a lot of young horses. They work well when you, it works well when you first put a bit in a horse's mouth. It encourages them to chew and, and get a nice uh, wet mouth. Um, so I use it fairly regularly in, the, in my training stable. Uh, thickness of your bit is not always uh, an indication of how mild or severe it is. It really depends on uh, on your horse and how much room it has in the in the mouth. Uh, somebody pointed out to me the other day that if when you close your mouth, how much room do you have in it that isn't taken up by your tongue? And you have the same situation with the horse. When the horse closes his mouth, that cavity is filled up by his tongue. So big mouth, small mouth, and it's really immaterial. Uh, although you can't put a big fat bit in a small mouth. Um, your bit should fit uh, about a half inch wider than the corners of the mouth, roughly. Uh, a little more, a little less. It's going to depend a little bit on the horse. Half inch for a pony may be too much. Half inch for a draft horse may not be quite a, uh, enough. But the cheek should fit away from the horse's mouth. It shouldn't be pinching and, uh, and squashing the lips of the horse. Uh, this, what's wrong with this picture? I'll tell you what's wrong with this picture. This bit's upside down. Uh, fortunately, this particular bit works well upside down or right side up. Doesn't really matter too much. So they were able to get away with it. But I thought it was fun. This came from a sleigh rally. Uh, happened to see it, so I took the picture. Uh, so. When it comes to selection uh, of the bit you want to use for your horse, keep it simple. Use what works. Uh, when you change bits in a horse's mouth, give it time to work. I usually uh, like to allow a week to 10 days before I've really decided whether a bit is going to work or not work. You have to remember that uh, uh, every bit feels a little bit like every other bit that a horse has in its mouth. And if a horse has been traumatized or had fear or pain from a bit in his mouth, uh, 
no matter what bit you put in there afterwards, he's always going to be a little fearful that uh, that pain and discomfort is going to return unless he's really convinced over time that that's not going to happen. So you've got to give it some time. Uh, sometimes you can tell right away a bit's not going to work. Uh, it's not an exact science. I'm fortunate as a trainer. I've got 85 bits on the wall, and I can just reach over and grab one. As a single horse owner, that's a, not so easy to do, and I fully appreciate that. So uh, maybe you can go to a trainer and borrow some bits from him, or, or you can go to your tax shop. Sometimes they'll let you take bits home and try them. Uh, but don't be afraid to experiment. Uh, don't, I'm constantly changing bits in my horse's mouth. Even horses I've had for 10 years, I still experiment and, and try things to see if I can get uh, them to go just a little bit better. It's an evolutionary process. The bit they start out in is very seldom the bit they end up in, even in the, under the best of circumstances. Okay, we have a bunch of questions on the bidding section of our presentation. Okay, um, go for it. On the, um, why do you suggest cutting the lower loops from the Kimberwick ring on that oh, yeah. one bit? I'll see if I can get back there. Um, that, there we go. This is the picture here where he says cut. This is a, a Myler Kimberwick, uh, low wide port Myler Kimberwick. I like it as a driving bit, actually. The reason I put this in here, this came from an illustration I was sending to somebody else. The original Myler Kimber work that was made in this country had enough space here to to put a rain. When they started having this uh, bit made over in Asia, that changed, and somehow these loops got closer together, and there was no place to put a rain here. Uh, so I got out my hacksaw and I cut this loop out of here uh, so that I could put a rain here. I found that very seldom. Uh, would I ever have a horse where the rein needed to go in this bottom ring, so I just got rid of it. And I can put a rein here, or I can put a rein into this ring here. And I actually did some clinics with uh, one of the My Dale Myler, uh, and I was a little reluctant to tell him I'd taken a hacksaw to his $75 bit and cut it up, but uh, he was very kind. He said, oh, do whatever you have to do to make it work. So that's why that's there. With um, the Liverpool bit, what is the difference between a fixed and a semi-fixed and a swivel cheek? And okay. when do you think you'd use each? <laughs> well, this is a swivel cheek here. These are all swivel cheeks, um, meaning that this cheek rotates on the end of the um, mouthpiece. A fixed cheek, they don't do that. Uh, and when you drive pairs, um, some drivers like to use that fixed cheek because the reins pull that cheek at an angle uh, on the inside. So they will, pulse. if you use a swivel cheek, it'll pull that cheek and press on the side of the horse's mouth. So in that situation, they like to use a fixed cheek, which doesn't do that. Semi-fixed cheek, I don't know if I've ever seen one. Um, I, I, I'm guessing that would be one that doesn't fully rotate all the way, uh, and, and it's for multiple hitches. What is the best way to measure a bit? Well, we go back, I think, right here to this slide here. Is you take a ruler and measure from the inside edge of the cheek. Let's lay it out like this. Measure from the inside edge of that cheek to the inside edge of that cheek. Uh, in this particular case, this is a 5-inch loose ring snaffle. Uh, and you have to be a little little careful because sometimes it's not exactly five inches, but they're really, they don't sell something as a five and one eighth inch bit. Uh, if it's close to five, it's a five inch bit. If it's close to five and a quarter, it's a five and a quarter. But that's how you measure it. What's kind of a rule of thumb that you should use as to how uh, much bit should be, you know, able to be seen in the horse's mouth off the sides? Uh, how, how wide? Yeah. Um, uh, a rough rule of thumb is uh, you want a, uh, a bit that's a half inch wider um, than the horse's mouth. So you have a quarter of an inch to a half an inch on either side sometimes. Uh, it's going to depend. And on a draft horse, you know, a horse with a big giant mouth like John Henry, he may have, you know, uh, 
that bit may actually be an inch wider than his entire mouth. But if you were to have an inch wider on a pony, it wouldn't work. Um, so you want to have some space so that the inside of that cheek is not pressing on the lips uh, and, and a little bit more. Do you have any suggestions for a bit that might work well for a horse that has a tendency to get his tongue over all the time? You have to ask yourself, why is he getting the tongue over? When I do clinics, the first thing I look at when a horse comes in the ring is what's he doing with his mouth. Horses manifest their anxiety in the mouth. When I see a very active mouth uh, that's you know, more active than just softly chewing uh, and and relaxing his mouth when it's kind of anxious looking. That, that horse is uncomfortable somewhere. It may not be in his mouth that he's uncomfortable. He may have sore hocks, he may have a sore back, he may have you know, all manner of discomfort, he may have sore feet, uh, but he's manifesting his anxiety in his mouth. Horses that are anxious in the mouth have a lot of excess mouth movement and a lot of times you'll see those kinds of horses flip their tongue over their bit just because their mouth is overly active and that's what happens. Um, there are horses who, uh, through their past history, have learned that they can flip that tongue over their bit, and you have to get sometimes quite creative on how to do that, uh, how to keep them from doing it. But generally, you have to find the source of the problem, and 99 times out of 100, it's because that horse is physically or mentally uncomfortable. That's why it happens. In a normal, happy, comfortable horse, you will not see them flipping the tongue over the bit, and you will actually see the uh, and with those horses, you can lower that bit quite low in a horse's mouth, and that bit tongue will stay where it belongs. Um, but there are some training fixes for horses that are confirmed tongue flippers. Uh, and, uh, if you want to email me privately on that, I'll discuss how to solve that. Um, can you touch a little bit on whether an aluminum bit causes dryness as, a, as in comparison to a copper or a rubber bit? Yeah, we're talking about the different metals yeah. that different bits yeah, are made of. The, the different metals that bits are made of. Um, I've I've only I, I, aluminum is one of those uh, metals that can be has a wide variation of of uh, uh, you know there's different grades of aluminum, different mixes. Uh, so it's not so easy to say aluminum does this or aluminum does that. Um, there are not very many that are made of aluminum. I, I know of one. Uh, the Micmar bit is made of aluminum, I think. Uh, I've used it. Uh, I have objections to it for other reasons than the fact that it's aluminum. It's, it would be nice if it worked because it's a nice light material, uh, but I don't know if any, um, I don't use them enough to be able to tell you uh, what kind of uh, you know, chemical reaction is going to take place in a horse's mouth with an aluminum bit. I just don't see that many of them. Is it more, uh, is there, have you, in your experience, have you seen that a copper mouthpiece? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that copper uh, or bronze, which is a mix of, of uh, tin and copper. Uh, you have sweet iron. You have um, cyprium, which is 90% copper and doesn't have any nickel in it. You have German silver, which is an alloy of copper, nickel, and zinc. Um, you have... Uh, all kinds of combinations of these metals, and the, the copper does cause some uh, electrical pro uh, situation in the mouth with the saliva, the acid in the saliva, and will generally uh, create a wetter mouth than uh, uh, other metals, so that's why it is used. I have seen it work. It does work. It does do that, but uh, so does latex. You put latex in the mouth, you'll get almost the same, same result. Um, and I think you have to be a little bit careful that just because it's creating a nice wet mouth doesn't necessarily mean that horse likes it. They may, and I, I think it would be hard pressed to tell really whether a horse liked the copper in his mouth or not. Um, and maybe you could with certain horses, but uh, generally uh, uh, the bronze works okay. Stainless steel, some horses don't like stainless steel, and I've even seen some horses that are allergic to some of the uh, synthetic bits. Okay. There's one question at the beginning here I'm trying to get back to. One moment. Um, uh, 
On, can you talk a little bit about the uh, the French link versus the Dr. Bristol? What the difference is in the links there in yep. the centerpiece? Yep. Okay. Well, uh, these two bits, the French link and the and the Bristol, are, have become very common uh, in the last ten years or so. Um, you used to only see the Dr. Bristol type bit, and the Dr. Bristol is characterized by this flat plate in the center. Every manufacturer makes this a little bit differently, and you have to be very careful when you buy these bits because uh, they're, they're, as I said before, they're not always right. Um, the angle at which they're placed in relation to the tongue, I've seen practically every degree under the sun of rotation of that uh, uh, plate from manufacturer to manufacturer. Some it's straight up and down on the tongue, some of it's laid back, some of them it's at an angle. Uh, you also see huge variation in the width of this plate. It can be a lot wider than this, it can be very narrow. This one starts to be pretty narrow. You also start to see on the, the French link is characterized by just having a short, small link here. Uh, and you see different shapes, you see different ways of connecting this. I don't have, I could probably have just as many uh, bits on the screen here, just variations of a French link. Um, one of the best bits I have is a core steel, uh, I think it's called a core steel bean bit. It's a French link bit. It's got a little bit of a nice round bean in there. I think it was $26. I didn't see any need to pay $120 for a, a German French link bit. This worked just great. Uh, it's just a nicely made bit. I don't know if they even know how nicely made it is. Um, that was a coarse steel bean bit. Um, but you have to be very careful with this Bristol bit. Uh, uh, it's actually a pretty harsh bit, I think. Um, I don't use them. I don't see them uh, used very often. Uh, and I'm not entirely convinced that the, these three-piece mouthpieces like these are all that great. One of the problems you have is uh, there's so many moving parts in the horse's mouth, they are not, it's not always clear what they're supposed to be paying attention to. And those bits can wrap around the tongue and wrap around the bars and, uh, and not be particularly comfortable. Personally, I'm partial to simpler bits. The, less, the fewer joints in the mouth, the better for me. Uh, and so when I start horses, I start with uh, a mullen mouth or a glory bit and just keep it simple. And then I don't have to worry about getting all that complicated with uh, multiple piece mouths. Um, and our last question here is, is uh, there's a question on the purpose of the voucher bit on the bottom here. Um, well, I've, I have a couple of these. I've used them for driving. I've not been particularly impressed. Maybe I just haven't hit the right horse. Uh, I've, uh, they look like they should work really well. Um, uh, but I haven't been able to really make it function well for a driving horse yet. Um, but I keep it there, I keep it on the wall, and I keep taking it out and trying it, and it just doesn't seem to really get the job done. It seems to twist in the horse's mouth in a way that, that doesn't really work. It's a very successful riding bit. I know it's used a lot in ridden dressage, uh, and they seem to be able to make it work. I have not had great success with it as a driving bit. Um, the purpose of it, my my guess is that it provides a little bit of crown pressure uh, off off the crown piece without having a chin strap a uh, curb strap on it. So I think that's that's what the, it's attempting to do. It's a very old bit design. It goes back a long time, uh, and it seems to have stood the test of time. But I've just never been able to make it successfully work as a carriage driving bit. But I keep trying. <laughs> Okay, we are a little bit over time. Um, it's 8.44. Yes, we're, we we're about 50 minutes over, but amazingly enough, we still have 377 people <laughs> that are hanging. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for sticking with it. Uh, that are hanging with us. A little bit. I'm sorry it dragged on a little bit long, but uh, very much appreciate everybody being here. And we still have more and more questions coming in. So the questions yeah. that we have coming in will now, those will be captured in a report that we'll be able to pull through and we'll uh, have Jeff will answer them in an FAQ um, after the session. Give him a couple days to yeah, <laughs> get those it, out there. It may take a couple of days to get them. <laughs> yeah, because there's quite a few. Um, but I also want to just remind you at the end of this um, presentation, you'll get an email that will have a survey in it.
please take a moment and fill out that survey and answer the questions on there. There's valuable information that we would like to gain from you as to how we can do better on the webinars and how we can offer you more and more things that you're looking for. We want to um, bring you topics that you're interested in. So um, I guess I'd like to say thank you so much to everybody for participating and a good night and good driving.